Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome again to this special live taping of Left of Black here on location at Lehigh University. Again, many thanks to Professor James Braxton Peterson for the invitation. And now we have sitting in the chair next to us, Professor Monica R. Miller. Thank and, you. and the R is important because it's like another Monica Miller. And I get who, her emails right, all the time. Who's also a brilliant <laughs> black awesome. woman academic. <laughs> but this is They're Monica like, R. Times interviews. And they don't want me. They want, no, thank you. But Assistant <laughs> Professor of Africana Studies and Religion and the Director of the Women, Gender, and, and Sexuality Studies, Studies Program yep. here at Lehigh University. She is the author of Religion and Hip Hop, published by Routledge in 2012. Mm -hmm. She is also the co-editor of two volumes, the Hip Hop and Religion Reader, co-edited with Anthony Penn, that was published by Routledge. Also, Religion and Hip Hop Mapping the New Terrain in the U.S., also co-edited with Anthony Penn, mm -hmm. that was published by Bloomsburg in the spring. And very shortly, the author of Changing Identity in the Study of Religion, Social and Rhetorical Techniques Examined, and that's published, will be published by October 1st. Equinox, yes. yes. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, and it's just incredible to have you here at Lehigh University. I'm thinking back to 2012 when I had the wonderful opportunity to <laughs> be on Left of Black, and it is one of those things for emerging scholars like oh my God, I'm gonna be on Left of Black. And it's like, <laughs> wow, and we're doing this again on Lehigh's campus. So again, thank you, you know, for being here with us. And also, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I did not shout out Dr. James Peterson for his vision. Yes, yes, it's very important. And to our co-sponsors, especially um, Bruce Taggart with LTS, this is really such an honor to be here. Well, I'm glad so, that you're here. Thank you for having me. So, you know, we've been talking Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a way in which we might think of there being some sort of disconnect between hip hop and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, Kendrick Lamar notwithstanding, folks like Tef Poe notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. um, when we think Black Lives Matter, we're not necessarily thinking 2 chains. Right. <laughs> we're, we're not necessarily thinking Meek yeah. Mill. Yeah. Um, we're not thinking Drake. We're not thinking Nicki Minaj. I mean, we could go on and on about what the public think hip, thinks hip hop is. Yeah and what the public thinks Black Lives Matter is. Mm -hmm. but, but do you see some sort of relationship, conversation, if you will, mm -hmm. between hip hop and Black Lives Matter at this point in time? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. I do, and I think that uh, the primary things that I see, the modalities, the, the flow, I'm thinking yeah, of yeah, your work yeah. on flow, I'm yeah. thinking Trisha Rose and yeah. so many others, I think that Black Lives Matter has a flow uh, to it. And it's uh, Professor Duncan was pointing out some of these things uh, in, in the previous segment. And it's the defragmentization, it's the deinstitutionalization. Mm. And what I really love about Black Lives Matter and for the people that are leading the movement is that I think there was even one quote um, by Alicia Garza, and she's like, look, you know, we didn't have a strategic plan. I love that language. There was no strategic plan. And it reminds me of the beginnings of uh, hip hop, right? Like, you know, you, you back to school, you gonna charge a quarter, you know, it, that things are sort of commodified and disciplined, but that there has to be room for, you know, what I call apparatic flow in, in, in my work and this kind of creative ingenuity. And I see that in this iteration. Um, of Black Lives Matter. We've always had Black Lives Matter, various strategies yeah, right. of social protests, you know, I mean, I think scholars such as Dr. Kathy Cohen and, you know, Michael Dawson, Dr. Michael Dawson, they've done well to show that these things are not homogenous. And for me, as someone who thinks about the politics of classification, historical contingency. Um, if you tell me something's green, I wanna know how it got to be green, green. and what are you thinking <laughs> that's on the other side? And so I love uh, how these co-founders and how those that are participative in the movement now, are they're shapeshifters. I think that's very, very important for leaving room for impossible possibilities. And so when Garza says there was no strategic plan, and if you're looking for leaders, 
of the Black Lives Matter movement, they will not be in the places where you think they ought to be. Yeah. I mean, and I way. think that's just really profound and, and significant for our moment. I, I think there's a way that we often forget that one of the foundational ethos of black politics, mm -hmm. of black life, is improvisation. Right. Right, right. That, that, that whole adage of make a way out of no way, right, right, really is a germ of this notion of the improvisational spirit. Right. And so that when she talks about not having a strategic plan, right, right. We're, we're trying to right. figure this out as we go, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. But the hip hop piece is interesting because if you think about if there was a subset of the black community that really was cutting edge in terms of their use of social media, right? Think about how hip hop artists and black art, music artists in, genera in general, used MySpace 10 years ago. Right. Right, <laughs> to create their yeah. brands. How they are the first adopters of, of YouTube, right, as a way to sell their music, right? right? And it's almost as if the movement, as young kids listening to these artists mm -hmm. and having to go to MySpace and YouTube and, and downloading stuff, that right. that becomes part of their process, their practice mm -hmm. in terms of their political movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, I think that the, the use of social media and Black Lives Matter, I mean, I just think it's absolutely, I just submitted an, an essay about this. I think it's brilliant, the techniques of strategies of social protest, the um, sort of um, I want to be careful about what word I use, but there's a certain kind of critical mass. There's various critical masses on uh, social media. You've got black Twitter, and, and that there are particular standards, I think, that are being put out there. You just can't say anything. You have to be thoughtful. So I think that the politics of social media and the politics of how we do activism, how we get the word out, um, whose posts we like, who we retweet, the politics of the retweet, the politics of the hashtag. <laughs> I remember like when we were like flipping our Facebook profiles up the hoodies, right? And like so quickly, that space became political. So I waited to see if like, okay, what academics are gonna put the hoodie up? I saw you put your hoodie up. I was like, okay, if, if Doc Neal can put the hoodie up, I can put the hoodie up. You know, Dr. Peaceroom got the hoodie up, right? Dr. Monica Coleman had the hoodie up. And so it's interesting how I'm sort of learning this process, yeah. but that there's a thoughtfulness. And also I think of fear, right? That there's a certain kind of intimidation that comes with expectation. And with the use of social media and the virtual uh, space, there's a politics of authenticity that emerges. So I remember, if I'm going to be reflexive and just say all, mm -hmm. like I remember thinking in my mind, okay, shoot, like I ain't got my hoodie up. Let me get my hoodie up, right? And and now I'm looking at other people that don't have their and, hoodie and why up. Why don't they have? Their you know. Hoodie. And so I think it's really interesting to to see that this is really extended beyond a certain kind of homogeneity, but that just as representative in all expressive cultures, there's a politics of authenticity that so quickly is on the table. And that's this. not always bad, but. Let's talk about this politics of authenticity for a second, right? Because, you know, one of the things that stands out clearly in terms of Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, the very visible prominence of black women. Right. Um, the very visible prominence of a black queer community, right? right? And an open acknowledgement that I would like to argue is unprecedented in yeah. black political movement yeah. of a black trans presence. Yes. Right. We, I can't think of any historical movements of blackness that even acknowledged right. that there was a black trans community that existed, let alone have it so prominently reflected right. in the context of this particular Black Lives Matter yeah. moment. I, I mean, what does that mean politically <laughs> going forward? Well, I think that, I mean, obviously it's an amazing uh, thing. And I think it, that we have not seen this before. I think we, I mean, for me, as a scholar of religion who's always thinking about time and space and historical contingency and, you know, so I want to honor things that are new. But the past is always present. So I see Baldwin in this. I'm thinking so much with Baldwin right now. Like, Baldwin is so here, you know. And, you know, Baldwin, he... You know, I mean, among so many other jewels in science that he dropped, you know, always calling for reflexivity, right? I think, I don't know if it was in the 1984 uh, Paris uh, Review interview, or I could be wrong, I, I, my memory might not be serving me well right now, but he says that the first person is the most terrifying view of all. 
And so I think that having this historical, um, you know, the, the, in the bodies that are creating the movement, the flow, the energy, it creates a new kind of accountability that we have not seen. You cannot do this thing if you are not talking about you know, sexuality in all of its exponential representations. And I think people are holding people accountable, right? Like, Be Bruston's not gonna be left out. Like, Baldwin's not gonna be left out. And so I think that this current sort of um, cosmology of difference and, 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 and things that are just multiplicative, holding blackness, like blackness means sexuality. It means poor folk. It means folk that are, you know, in the 1% getting out there in the street. Right? It's keeping in check the politics of respectability, but also leaving room for the proliferation of new forms of difference. And I think because of it, hip hop is learning. So if you've got J. Cole on the ground and you've got Lauryn Hill, I wrote a public piece where I critique neurotic, uh, with neurotic society. Yeah. And, and, and so there was a part in there that was transphobic. And I, was, I called that out. And I think she responded to it in some other forum, but I think that now we're in this moment where we can talk about blackness and that blackness does not have to be distinct from gender, sexuality. Of course, it's always co-constituent with it. Matter, That's right? exactly right. <laughs> You know, and so I like how the virtual space and how social media, you know, I'm thinking of, um, I mean, of course, you know, the, the work that you provide and uh, Dr. Peterson and that you know, Niall Ford and you've got all of Darnell Moore and these brilliant voices and everyone is using this space of uh, social media and digitized forms to hold folk accountable in a public way though. We're not having these backdoor conversations. If I'm calling you out, I'm calling you out on Facebook. And that's very important because we should have contestation. And that's been always, I think for me, my um, sort of uh, fear of talking about leaders. I like this idea, there are no leaders. I like this idea that we can't point towards one person, that we know there were a few uh, women who also span you know, these dimensions of difference and they're able to allow it to proliferate. So the chapter over here doesn't look like the chapter over there. It literally deconstructs coherence. That is very important, I think, for revolutionary politics. Let's talk about the recirculation of Baldwin for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's intensely important. Right, because of the voice that he represented in yeah. the 60s. Um, but I'm wondering, to, to recall another one of his contemporaries, mm -hmm. right, do you ever see a moment where we talk about Audre Lorde? Right. Um, right. You know, who's also working along that same kind of axes mm -hmm. of complicating blackness, I would argue even more so. <laughs> um, and, and is very willing to openly talk about, you know, what her identity means in terms of raising sons. Right and things of that nature. Do you ever see a context in which Audre Lorde is recovered in the same way that Baldwin has been really recovered? Interesting. And, and if we yeah. think about, say, someone like ta, -Na ta Coates mm -hmm. as kind of, you know, ground zero for this reemergence of Baldwin mm -hmm. at this moment, you know, do we have a space in the larger culture that allows for a black woman's voice to emerge? Right. That, it, that in the same context might bring an Audre Lorde forward to the forefront? Fascinating question. I mean, I would argue that we have that, you know, I don't know and I don't see it as much, right? So even this whole, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but the whole debate of, you know, is, you know, so and so the new James Baldwin. Right. Like, I'm not, I, I, I like the conversation, but for me, the question is discursively problematic. Right. Um, the past is present, sure, right? right. Um, but, you know, to be, you know, to hold something emergent and contemporary to, you know, this standard the in the past, past. Yeah. you know, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. James Cohn, Black Theology of Liberation, he, you know, would ask him these, I, I would call milk bank questions, like, so do you think that, you know, what so-and-so is doing now is similar to what, and I was obsessed with Angela Davis and Malcolm and Asada Shakur, and right, and he was like, stop comparing people with people. He was like, they spoke for their generation, you know, Jeff Chang reminds us in, you know, um, so many ways, uh, you know, that, that, that generations are fictions in this way. They're fictions. They're what demographers need to divide up and classify in ad hoc ways that are political in nature. Right. 
but I think that it's still very much, uh, you know, over and hyper masculinized. And I, and I, to be reflexive, I do it in my work. I'm trying to challenge my own self. And I think that, you know, this is where a Nicki Minaj is very important. This is where Erica Badu, I think, who's been doing so much of this work for so many years, and everyone's like, she's crazy. You know what I mean? And I don't think, you know, not to use that word to medicalize but, but almost, or to use that word have lately. But you to do that but in order to be able to function on your own terms right. in the culture. That's right. I mean, I think Janet Mock is doing that work. I think Janet Mock is doing Absolutely. that work around, I mean, black lives and to do this work and to be able to occupy spaces, you know, um, big spaces and small spaces and to be willing to be on, you know, MSNBC and then the next day to talk to a room full of five, you know, women or trans men or trans, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's very powerful. I think she's doing that work. I don't necessarily see her being foregrounded in that kind of way, but I think Nicki Minaj does that work when she's, you know, looking ass niggas, I mean, right? <laughs> you know, when she's saying something about that, right? So I think it says something about strategies of social protests and who are we accountable to, but who are we? Like, who yeah. is the we, yeah. you know? Who is the we? So I think that it's always up for reinvention, and I think that, I think the Feminist Wire has done really well Absolutely. to bring Lord to the table and to Absolutely. remind us of, you know, Angela Davis, to remind us of, you know, um, Asada Shakur, and so many others. Crunk Bell feminist. Hooks, you know, crunk feminist collect. Yeah. yeah, we have these spaces, and thank goodness for them. For that historical memory to contest that amnesia, I think that's so easily, um, it's interesting. We have these women that created this thing, right? Um, and, and they're not trying to claim hold to uh, a certain kind of hegemony of meaning with it. They're allowing it to kind of fragment and yeah, disperse right. and be different things that they're not necessarily, as far as I know, in terms of the narrative that this chapter can't do that and this chapter you know, can't do that. So I think that the flexibility to not domesticate hmm. these politics are very important. And I think that Baldwin was always up for reflexivity. Lord is reflexive, you know. Bell Hooks in many kinds of ways maintains a certain kind of reflexivity. Angela Davis is very big on reflexivity. And so the only thing that concerns me about movements is that we just need to pluralize and make them multiplicative. Where the Black Lives Matters movements. Not a movement, right. You know what I mean? That there's all of these things. But with the church being decentralized from this, I think it's fascinating. So let's talk about that piece. Um, <clears throat> Because when we think about historical black social movement, mm -hmm. right, the, the church is always in the room, right? Always. The church is always in the room. The American South is always in the room. If we look at a, a black diaspora in the United States right now, it is not Southern Negroes who can trace their lineages back <laughs> 10 generations to a plantation in Mississippi, right? right? It's first, second, third generation from Ghana, Nigeria, mm -hmm. <laughs> Senegal, um, five, six generations now from the Caribbean, right. five, six generations from Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, right? The fact that Rosa Clemente mm -hmm. claims her blackness, right. right, in a way that complicates, right? When we think about Yava Blay's work and how she represented this wide range of folks who would claim blackness that when, if some of these folks walked into the room right now, uh, uh, we would not immediately go, that's a black person, right? right? So. It's all complicated in ways that we've right. never seen before. Right. Um, what role does hip hop play? Well, I right, think in that- In bridging these divides. Yeah. I don't, I mean, it's, it's definitely, I think hip hop has been always in, in many ways on the front lines of a certain kind of spontaneity that social protests, mm -hmm. you know, movements and practices need. I think that um, one has to be able to sure have an agenda, but one that is not so overdetermined and one that is not, not open-ended as to foreclose democratic possibilities. So I think that like what hip hop is learning from Black Lives Matter is that they need to check their homophobia. They need to check their classism. They need to check their social locations. They need to check, you know, what sorts of interstices they're occupying. So it's brilliant, I think. I think Black Lives Matter holds hip hop accountable and hip hop is challenged to respond and therefore like confront their own, you know, sort of um, 
politics that are problematic, homophobic and misogynistic. So I think that there's learning happening on both ends. But when I think about, you know, going back to the quote, you know, um, there was no strategic plan. We don't really have leaders. We have people doing things and they're shape shifting. I think of flow in hip hop. Hip hop is newfangled. You never know what people are going to do. And it you talk about ability yeah, to the beat. It, yeah, right. in the time, in the moment. And it's right. always, you know, it's unsuspecting. And I think that's what we also see in Black Lives Matter. And I don't think one's teaching the other. I think that, you know, there's a certain kind of logic of practice that's being remixed and sampled from both, which yeah. is why I think seeing, you know, them on the ground in different ways um, but to also see how hip hop is digitizing and lyrically um, becoming that transatlantic commuting way of getting this stuff over to, you know, folks in Switzerland and Germany and to North Africa and so many other places and yeah. in Japan and so many other places. So hip hop and its ability to be shape shifty you know, in terms of the politics of authenticity, they know they've got to shout this stuff out. So there's just this practical aspect to it. Um, and there's a lot of them that are not talking about it as well. But I think what hip hop provides is that hip hop is ready to kind of be in many places. There's a kind of omniscience to it. They're ready to be in so many different places at so many different times. And hip hop is always willing to change the technique. Hmm. One minute, you know, you're hearing this song on the radio, and two seconds later, Kanye West, you know, all he has to do is hit Twitter, tell his fans to be at 66 different buildings around the world. Like, the, to me, that's about, like, black life and, you know, black lives and all of its multiplicity, its ability to be in all places at once. And he's telling the world he's a god. We think he's in Basel, Switzerland, probably in Art Basel or something doing this. And in real time, digitizing diaspora, because we have no idea where he is. And he's telling you that he's a new slave through the modality of transmuting himself into a god. Because only gods can be in many places at once. That's diaspora, and that's Black Lives Mattering to me. Like, let me show you I'm God. You know, but let me show you how um, God still have problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so, and so I think it's an interplay and an exchange between the two. Yeah. You know, when we, uh, it's brilliant. When, when these rappers are on the ground in Ferguson and so many other cities around the world and places around the world, I think that it's this kind of connective synergy yeah. that is being provided. You know, there's, um, Professor Duncan mentioned this in, in, in the segment before, you know, a codedness. I love the, that fact that hip hop has retained a codedness. We think about the five percenters you in the 60s. Still gotta unpack it. Still gotta you gotta unpack, unpack it. it. Right. You know, so we're in this moment where there's all of these things happening. There's, you know, the, the tragedy of black illegibility. There's the power of social media to get the word out and organize and get folk, you know, held accountable. Right. And then there's also this moment where there are the, the, these profound, you know, sorts of things happening. It's, it's a moment where I think like, what, what does it mean to be black? It's very complicated. Talk a little bit about the new book. New, What's it, what, new book, what's it about? Oh, which one? No, the new Black Odds. <laughs> I'm working on too many projects. The one that's about to drop. The one that's about to drop. <laughs> so that um, I'm actually that this text that's about to drop, claiming identity yes. in the study of religion, is about the social and rhetorical techniques um, that maintain talk of religion, that maintain talk of race. So not necessarily what is religion or what is race. And in fact, in, in terms of what I do, I'm more deconstructive and interested in the politics of classification. I'm not interested in what blackness is. I'm interested in what it is through the discourse of what it cannot be, which is why Rachel Dolly, y'all, I don't wanna just, you know, go there for, I mean, we might be here for a long time, but, Right, that was fascinating to me, and to look at that relationship. So claiming identity is about like how to bring Baldwin in conversation with you know critical discourses and theory and methods and study of religion, and how religion is identity. This move towards religion as identity, and I think that when we think about the black church, you know, being de-radicalized, decentralized, trying to be on the ground in these right. movements, 
and being told that like, no, it's not your moment, it's not your time, it's, we're not working with your strategies anymore. So you can be here, but you're not gonna be central, you're not right. gonna be foregrounded. Right. And so claiming identity in the study of religion, social and rhetorical techniques, is all about looking at the techniques that make these spaces possible. You know, what makes, um, what, what gives black Twitter the power to literally in like, I don't know what, 30 minutes, take down Paula Deen's empire. It's incredible to me. Like that's absolutely incredible. Or to make sure the juror that was, you know, on right. the George Zimmerman trial doesn't not book. get a book, book contract. contract. That's powerful to me, yeah. you know? So I just, I, I think it's very complicated, but I think it provides a really productive moment to continue the complications of what is black. And, and I think the Rachel Dolezal moment was, you know, and, and then the Sean King thing that just popped up, right? Like, which is very interesting. And then, and then there's the Andrea Smith, you know, conversation which deals with indigeneity and First Nation Native American stuff. And it was interesting to see how social media digitized and mediated that conversation in ways that we did not do with Rachel Dolezal. Like there's something about that conversation that really, really, really disturbed me on social media, the Dolezal piece. Yeah. Very disturbing to me. Because here's what I saw. I saw, of course, I'm, no names mentioned, uh, but I saw people, I saw people who I thought to be and who I knew were your social constructionists, your postmodernists, your black feminists, you know, your uh, Latina feminists, your nihilists, your so many other categories, right? And on all other points of difference, and on all other points of social difference and identity-based difference, we're social constructionists. And so it's interesting how to digitize social construction and then flip it on its head and re-essentialize it in ways that is not happening with Black Lives Matter. Now there's these sort of policing techniques and mechanisms at work within the, these advanced processes of marginalization. Right. So this one thing that provides a moment, I think, of right. immense possibility, I think it reminds us that Possibility is always impossibility. Now, I'm not saying that Dolezal didn't have some problems of psycho. I'm not a psychoanalyst. Uh, yeah, I do like Lacan. I do think with psychoanalysis. And I think that there was probably some over-identification there. <laughs> some. There, there might be some. Right? But, but I want to be like, and this is where hip-hop for me is about transmuting problem status into creative possibility. I want to think in a very futuristic, kind of post-human, Afro-futuristic way. Like, for me, to be intellectually honest about categories of identity, and again, this is still answering the question, the claiming identity is about thinking about this, when people want it both ways. Right. And we need to be intellectually honest well, about that. that um, yeah. I'm not saying she should be black. I'm not saying she <laughs> should have or should not have talked about her own, you know, um, reinvention of herself. But there is something wrong within the digital space when we are going to embrace this, this, this. And in rhetoric, we're going to embrace the slippage of here and here and here. And we know that identity is fluid. And we know that movements are fluid and leaders are fluid. But when it comes to this one individual, we're essentialists. We literally went back to being essentialists. And as someone who is okay with social categories and identity categories being fluid and moving, and that agency, again, going back to the founder, you know, the co-founders yeah, sure. of Black Lives, it's important to be able to name for yourself. So why am I going to advocate for the slippage over here and the flexibility and the fluidity and the queerness of politics over here, but over here, I'm disciplining a white person who literally, like, who's I don't know what she black, got. Who's politically black. Yeah, what right. does it mean to be politically, politically black. black in right. a digital moment? And, and, and it seems as though you would want more, as many white people as possible, <laughs> right? <laughs> to be politically right. black, right? <laughs> You know, and so I think that we're just at this really interesting coterminous moment of increasingly complex 
possibility and impossibility. Yeah. And I think that hip hop brings it to that. I think we get the flow, we get the energy, we get the movement, we get the ability to shape shift. One day, I think of Pac, right? And I'm, I'm thinking with Pac a lot because I'm teaching with him and thinking with him a lot this semester. Like, you, you can take a listen to one Pac interview. He's like, look, I'm, I'm going to get conspiratorial. You take one of the O's out of good, it's God. You add a D to evil, it's the devil. Look, some cool person sat down a long time ago and said, they were gonna find a way to control you. And then two seconds later, he's talking about how he got love from the gods in jail, you right. know? And then he's gonna backtrack and say, why does God need gold ceilings to talk to me? So now you talked about God, metaphysically God, embodied in the flesh as Allah, arm, leg, leg, arm, head, you know, peace to the gods. And then and within that, you've get 20 different iterations of different kinds of ways to play with ideas, politics, social movements, and I think in the end, you know, or at least I try to, you know, suggest in my work and in class, he didn't, he's not interested in God. So I wonder if even <laughs> some of this soul, he's interested in critiquing society. He's interested in thug life, you know, kind of being about this raw ability to move in and out of spaces that are complicated. For me, this is what hip hop, and I, and I know the movement is doing it now, Black Lives does it now, they hold these things in tension. You don't sacrifice your sexuality for your blackness, you don't sacri sacrifice class for oh, your black, gender, right. you can do it all, so it's historic and it's unprecedented, I agree with you. And I think that hip hop and form and content have been doing that for a really long time. If I think about Clarence 13, X, you know, not to hyper-masculinize it, but I think about like gods on the corner in like, the 60s calling them call, black men calling call themselves, themselves god right. you know as you have white folk and, and walking hearing by it, you and hearing it echoed in jay electronica 40 years like ago, right? but but here's the thing about this moment of you know coterminous sort of capacity and and and, and debility we got a black president we've got bodies laying in the streets for four hours. We've got social media popping because of this, you know, journal citizenship that's taking place and documenting and archiving. So that's bringing in the data and all of these things are happening. Like what moment is this? Yeah. We've been joined. So I don't know. <laughs> we have we been talked joined about a whole this, lot of this things. This evening by <laughs> Professor Monica R. Miller, Assistant Professor of History, excuse me, Africana Studies, Religion, mm -hmm. and Director of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality yes. Studies Program here at Lehigh University. Those of y'all who get the chance to take her classes, consider yourself very fortunate. Oh, thank you Fortunate so to have you spend some time with us this evening. Thank Honor you, Monica. Honored to be here. Thank you again for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> black lights and boots burn when I record for watch, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back.